This is Zone One Radio. Zone One Radio. Hello, I'm Steve Phillips, and welcome to Audio Book Club, the world's only interactive audiobook review podcast. This is Chapter Two. So, not many listeners so far. We're new, which means this is intimate, and we'll be sharing stories I only tell my friends. Cary Grant greets me at the front door in a white terry cloth bathrobe. Hello, young man. Jennifer's in her room. Would you like some milk? He says in his Cary Grant voice. You liked us before we got famous, and we thank you for that, you lovely little hipster you. We raise our cans of overflavored, overstrength, overpriced craft beer in your general direction. This week, we are turning up where we're not invited again to eavesdrop as Rob Lowe reads us stories I only tell my friends. I say we, if you're new, and let's face it, you probably are. I have two pet contributors who join me in London from Adelaide in South Australia. We've already done an episode one, so there is canon, there's continuity. So as a callback, welcome back to our critics who listen. Patient pleaser Cheryl Monkhouse and sausage man Matt Layton. Cheryl, how are you? Divine. How are you? Very good. Thank you. Thanks again for asking. Matt, uh, and yourself? 4.78, Steve. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. It's usually a 10. I don't know what we're talking about. No, 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 no. Look, there have been very few ways in history to objectively measure whether somebody is a good human being or not. That's true. And fortunately, I've found one, and it is the Uber passenger rating system. And I'm happy to report that I fly in near the top with a rating of 4.78 in spite of being either herding two dirty children or horribly drunk. So even in those stressful situations, I'm uh, yeah, a, a, a better human being than my wife, who's only a 4.52. And I know, Steve, that you like to um, spend the time when we're doing these podcasts mainly reading nonsense on the internet if the last episode was anything to go by. Yeah. Uh, so maybe by the end of this, you can tell us what kind of human being you are by uh, going into your Uber app. Yep. And, oh, I think Cheryl's doing it now. I'm doing it now. <laughs> she's, she's, going, she's going into the menu, which you probably have caused to, never have caused to use. Not and the result is that Cheryl is a... 4.81. Oh. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> Cheryl is a better human being by this objective scale yes. than I am. <laughs> What about you, Steve? Um, I'm, uh, my phone's reinstalling the app. It's got this habit of uh, uninstalling things, but uh, I suspect this is becoming slightly right. too dull yeah, for our listeners, so yeah. we shall... Very yeah. convenient. No, we shall yeah, rein it in. That's Very unfortunate. convenient. We'll revisit, revisit the Planet Audio Book Club, and uh, we would like you to come and play with us. Here are the rules. Each episode, we'll review an audio book. We'll talk not only about the content, but also how it's performed. We want you to get involved. It's really simple. Just use the hashtag Audio Book Club on Facebook or Instagram and give us your opinion. If you're feeling verbose, there's lots of room for longer, more insightful critique on our Facebook page. Just go to Facebook and tap Audio Book Club into the white box in the blue bit at the top. Uh, that's Audio Book Club, all one word. Now, the next rule is at this point, the person who suggested the book to give us a brief overview of the book and an explanation as to why she, Cheryl, or he, Matthew, has brought the book to the table and asked us to spend 10 hours of our lives listening to it. So, Cheryl, this one's your fault. Stories I Only Tell My Friends by Rob Lowe. Who is this Rob Lowe you speak of, and why on earth did you make us listen to this book? So, many of us of a certain age grew up with Rob, potentially donning our walls, the pages of our Teen Beat magazine, watching our coming-of-age films such as The Outsiders or St. Elmo's Fire, relative heartthrob of sorts, and then others of us have come to meet him through The West Wing, Brothers and Sisters, some of his older movies that he's done where he is much more tame and um, more kind-hearted and gentler in nature. So when you see these two, this dichotomy of an actor where he starts out as a rabble rouser, part of that brat pack with, you know, Emilio Estevez, Charlie Sheen, Demi Moore, Judd Nelson, many others. Um, Then he moves into the likes of Martin Sheen on the other end of the spectrum, Um, Sally Field, you kind of wonder who is this guy and how did he get from there to here? And 
I had been told about this book from a friend from my actual book club, and they said, hey, let's you know, look, think about reading it. And in all honesty, when I found out that he actually narrated his own book with that uber sexy voice of his, mm. I decided maybe I'd rather listen to him for 10 hours than spend my time reading it. And here we are. And he really does take us from those humble beginnings, doesn't he? You know, from uh, from Dayton, Ohio, through to Malibu, and so on. Um, let's have a have a listen to that briefly. Cue the music, Elton John's "Goodbye Yellow Brick Road." As I kiss my grandparents and hop into the packed car, Bill's not there. He is gone, unable to watch, saying his goodbyes and hugging us boys in the middle of the night. My football gang is there too, the kids of the great hard scrabble North Dayton families, the Freemans the Scarpellis, the Eiferts. They run alongside the car as we pull away. I want to jump out, tell my mom, don't do this, don't make us go, I'm scared. I want to stay here with my friends, but I say nothing, I'm frozen inside. My brothers and I watch as our friends begin to stop running, falling by the wayside, unable to keep up, as our car speeds off into the distance. Chapter 4 I have never seen so many cars in my life. Our Volvo station wagon is stopped dead in the middle of the biggest, busiest freeway I have ever seen. It's 80 degrees in the middle of winter, and the sky is the color of a baseball mitt. To my left, eight guys in a pickup are blasting accordion music, like what you might hear at a circus. To my right is a trailer hauling cars. One of them is the Batmobile. Welcome to Los Angeles, kid. So we hear throughout the course of the book and certainly the early chapters that some run in pretty much in, in uh, at a very slow, almost linear pace, don't they? You can do 24 hours in one chapter, then suddenly, whoosh, we start getting into the mu- the movies, the excess, the people he meets, and the people he meets as well both. Um, it's a- extraordinary, isn't it, how he, he just happens to drop those famous people's lines. He'll be talking about, uh, yes, and one day I was working on a farm and there was someone just you know, forking manure into a dump and i often wonder what would happen to uh, janet jackson after that and um and that the way he just kind of name drops is a very sort of matter of fact way of uh, did you find that interesting so it's odd that his mum of all people goes to see this healer of sorts and they make their way from ohio to malibu which is obviously la adjacent And he calls it sort of this sleepy little hamlet that nothing goes on in Malibu and nobody who's anybody is from Malibu. And yet he goes down to the farmer's market and sees these kids playing, um, making a film about uh, the war. And he asks to be in it. And it's Emilio Estevez, Charlie Sheen, Sean Penn, you know. And so right from the get go, he's stumbling into Hollywood royalty. It's just, you know, then he goes trick-or-treating and this guy jumps out of the bushes and kind of harangues them. And as he as they walk away, they're like, well, you always wanted to meet Martin Sheen. And there he is. So it's just incredible to me that, you know, if he hadn't gotten there the way he did, how do you think he would have gotten there? It just, I think it's all a bit of luck. It's a bit of stick to itness, you know, what kind of a kid throws himself into Liza Minnelli's hotel room and has a conversation with her while she's in her robe, you know, or butts his way into Telly Savalas's signing and makes sure he gets a lollipop. I mean, all those little things really show a kid with the chutzpah to get there, but life really served him up a silver spoon when he landed himself in Malibu. Can I just say at this yeah, point, like, my turn, Steve. I just want to say at this point, yes, yeah, raise Mr. your hand, Mister Rob, <laughs> <laughs> Mister Rob Lowe, give a give a kid a chance. You know, talking to the big stars. We tweeted him, asked him to come on our show. Did he? Did he even get back to us? No. So I think he's a hypocrite. <laughs> I can't think why he wouldn't get back to uh, to a cast of, of a podcast uh, into their second episode. Um, yeah, it, it's a strange one that, but uh, maybe he might come on next week. You know, once he realises um, how, how uh, popular this is uh, or not. Um, let's uh, get back to the, the. I think it's because you didn't show up at his hotel room. 
<laughs> ah, ah. <laughs> I, didn't, I, I didn't throw myself into his bathrobe as it were yes you're probably quite right let's get let's turn back to that actually there's a really there's a really great clip actually which kind of embellishes that 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 kind of point about the the, the hollywood role to that he runs to the tiny agency that represents me has another young client who has just landed a big role she lives in new york is around my age and is going to be in california for some meetings my agent arranges for us to have lunch my relationship with Corey is the extent of my dating, so I'm a little nervous even though I know this isn't a romantic meeting. Any time a young teenager spends with a member of the opposite sex is fraught with expectations. Will she like me? Will I like her? Is she cute? Will she think I'm cute? What if I make a fool of myself? The scouting report says she's an extremely smart musical theater actress who is taking Broadway by storm as the new Annie. Those are big heels to fill, so she's got to have some serious game. I'm nervous to meet her. I'm just one of four kids in a TV family, but she's fucking Annie. So he goes out for dinner with this person. Steve, can you remember who this person is? Um, no, I've completely forgotten. Who is that? Cheryl? Sarah Jessica Parker. Yeah, she's called Sarah. She's got curly hair. She's about his age. 21 years later... Oh, sorry. I'll play you the clip. <laughs> 21 years later, I'm at the Golden Globe ceremony nominated for Best Performance by an Actor in a Television Drama for The West Wing. I don't win that night, but while I'm disappointed, I'm thrilled when Sarah Jessica Parker does win for her smash, Sex in the City. So I was at the BBC a few years ago, and um, and, and I, I was just wondering who, I was just walking uh, down a corridor, having to get in the lift, and who should be in the lift but uh, Eric Sykes. There we go. Uh, so now we're assuming to name dropping city. Anyone else want to have a, a name drop? Uh, you and I were once in a pub and we saw Lionel Blair. We did. We did. Oh, the legend of Give Us a Clue. Cheryl, you really missed out on this when you were in America. Give Us a Clue. It was just incredible. Yeah, it was amazing. Cheryl? Oh, yeah, no, Cheryl, Cheryl's, are really, Cheryl's are really good. Cheryl's much cooler than us. Nah. Um, Matt, what did you think of the book? And it turns to you. Come on, Cheryl, come <laughs> on. <laughs> oh, that's for another time. That's for when we actually get you in person and I can tell some good yes. stories. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, Matt, what did you think of the book overall? Um, I really enjoyed it. Um, uh, I have to say that... Again, I'm not as cool as Cheryl. Rob Lowe has almost completely passed me by. Um, I've been thinking all day about how to say this politely because one shouldn't refer to a lady's age, uh, as you know. Um, but if someone very much like Cheryl had a similar... Ba if that somebody was maybe five five years older than me, then they probably would not, obviously not meaning Cheryl or calling her old or anything. Uh, but uh, for me, my, I was very lucky. I was uh, seven when E.T. came out, like lead character Elliot. I was the right age for Stand By Me and I was the right age for Dead Poets Society. And I think the films that Rob Lowe was in particularly The Outsiders, just seemed a little bit too old and frightening and cool uh, for me. So I think, uh, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't have been able to pick him out of a lineup. We do have, we were given by a, a lovely friend of the family called Anne, we were given a box set of The West Wing uh, just before the girls were born. Right? Our kids are seven and she gave us the full box set and uh you know you're going to be spending a lot of t time indoors she said so here's something for you to do while you're there but when you've been sort of rustling children all day and all night the last thing you want to watch is something intelligent and well written <laughs> <laughs> so um, yeah. i i do i do know where they are they are in the box in one of the boxes in the garage and i love aaron sorkin's writing i love studio 60 but i, do, I you know i i came to this slightly cold um and yeah i uh, uh i but i i enjoyed it anyway um i i was my one gripe i think is uh as you know zomon radio has done a lot of work on people recovering from addiction and there seems to be uh part of of this book where he's saying i have recovered from addiction uh and what you normally get, uh, and what Russell Brand did on the radio station, 
uh, which is sort of a, an on-demand AA meeting, was that you get the first half hour is all the tawdry stories of how you woke up in a dustbin and ruined everyone's life. Um, and uh, uh, then the second half of it, you spend saying how difficult it is, how you have to do everything day by day, but how much better a person you are now and how much you've learnt. Um, and I just felt that we're getting the second half of that mm. without too many details of the first part of it. And I don't know about it. I'm sitting here looking at Cheryl, and I know I've brought this up with her, and she says, well, that's not... You said that's not where you come from. That's not your point of view. Right. So, obviously, growing up in the States and with him during the time of the Outsiders and St. Elmo's Fire... Um, we did get the headlines. You know, we did get in, nine, in 88 that he was in Atlanta, Georgia during the Democratic National Convention. And he had probably one of the first videotaped nationally broadcast trysts with uh, a woman who unfortunately was 16. And although he met her in a bar with her mother, they were both drinking, and you're not allowed to be under 21. You know, he was under fully under the impression that she was of age. Now, hold on a second. Isn't the Democratic Convention of 1988 mentioned in this book at some point? Yes. So he's mentioned that. But he does not mention... But he's glossed over the fact that... He, he does mention that the, this videotape that gets out basically ruins his movie, ruins the outcome, ruins his chances, and, and he's tarnished because he is really one of the first stars. You know, it's not like Kim Kardashian who became super famous for her sex tape. Mm. It's not the same. Now, you know, you want, you want to be Paris Hilton, you want to have your sex tape. Yeah. Back then... We, please don't tell me we have to. <laughs> no, no, I think we can... Just we skim over that. that. Yeah, yeah. But it's one of those where he was probably one of the first. And as a society, we did not forgive and forget as we do now. So this followed him for a very long time. So I understand that he didn't want to bring it up. But, you know, it was easy for me to Google it and bring everything back up and say, oh, yeah, I remember that. I remember reading the headlines, seeing it. Um, obviously not online because it really wasn't there was no internet back then so you know although it seems like it was big it was in just a small section of the entertainment section of the newspaper but you heard about it on tv um yeah so this is the thing so not only is a hypocrite he's kind of a liar too right <laughs> um because okay so so my slightly more embellished point on, on, on in that direction is that as you've mentioned the book starts with uh, his kind of adoring portrayal of John F. Kennedy Jr. Correct. and finishes that way as well and it seems to be some sort of Stalinist version of the way he's lived his life where there were some things that happened in the past there uh, but mm -hmm. now I live with my wife and my children and everything is good and <laughs> uh, uh, I'm almost, and I've always been into politics. I've always been environmentally aware and blah, 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 blah. And in the current climate, I'm wondering, and I don't want to say this too directly, is he dipping his toe in the water to see if he can stand for office? Well, he actually helped um, Schwarzenegger get elected uh, back in the early 2000s. So he advocated very staunchly for Arnold. So I, he's not unfamiliar with the actual campaigning and, and the in the campaigning trail i i could see him doing something you know he's very smart he's very adept he has said continuously how much he has been engaged and involved and follows politics it would be a logical next step but can he erase the videotape enough well in the same way that he has done in this book or would that kill any campaign that he ran at present we have a sitting 
politician mm. who has claimed many things, um, grabbing women by the you know what and the twinkle, the twinkle, yeah. yes, the th- and <laughs> the twinkle, you know. Uh, what do we make of the Cary Grant impression? <laughs> <laughs> Steve, I, I, we love. I've got some. I've got loads of clips with impressions, Steve. I, I've got. A, I've I will got, say. Got a little bit carried there, away. There are there are a number of things that I have discovered about Rob that I, I simply adore. One of them is the fact that he is exceptionally intelligent and very well written and well spoken. Um, I, I do. I love the way that this book is laid out. It feels very smart. Mm-hmm. I enjoy the fact that he uses large words, big words, m- multisyllabic, mm-hmm. mind you. Um, and just the joy that I got from hearing the number of his impressions. Because mm. there's nothing worse than an audiobook when someone tries to pull off a female voice, an impersonation, and an, an anything. Mm. And it's just horrible and then you get through the entire thing and you're like that i i've stopped several books because of that but i truly am impressed by the scope and breadth of his just i don't want to say comedic genius but he is extremely gifted in that and, and even the fact that you know he was pulled into wayne's world by mike myers and they developed their own friendship you know tommy boy the way that he just deadpans things is Let's 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 do it. I've got some clips, Steve. Uh, I'm going to go first okay. with one that uh, I think Cheryl might have forgotten, but Ron Howard. Mm, that's right. I did forget that one. Yeah, yeah. Hold on a second. Yeah. Let, me, let me do this. Opie Cunningham. The first day on the set, the director, Ron Howard, who at that point was still playing Richie Cunningham on Happy Days, takes me aside. He's only directed once before, a low-budget B-movie called Grand Theft Auto, and he seems as nervous as I am. Rob, I really need you to tear out on your bike after your last line. I mean, just as fast as you can, just crank it, he says. I'm cooking like a sausage in my skin-tight purple spandex, but this request has my blood running cold. Clearly, no one has told him that I can't ride a motorcycle. I only just learned how to drive a car, let alone really crank it. I always assumed a stunt double would do the motorcycle work. I break the news to Ron with as much dignity as I can muster. And in a mark of what a great director he will become, he just smiles, reassures me, and figures out another way to shoot the scene. I say my last line, something like, Let me show you what this baby can do! Out of my way! And two elderly crewmen, hiding just off camera, attempt to roll me out of frame. It takes forever. Thrills and chills never made it onto the air. It never made it onto Ron Howard's filmography, either. To my knowledge, the producers didn't even bother to show it to anyone. I've certainly never seen it. And although he's always gracious when we meet and is one of my favorite directors, I never worked for Ron Howard again. That's because you're a liar and a hypocrite, mate. Oh, <laughs> oh harsh. And actually, it's a good point, actually. Some of his description of the, the projects he worked on, but not only the projects he worked on, but also people he uh, came into contact with, like Martin Sheen and so on. Um, how did you find... Uh, one thing that stood out for me, and I'd be good to get your thoughts on this, was his description of the Apocalypse Now filming, which just seemed absolutely incredible what the actors had to go through during the course of that. Do you remember this? <laughs> I, I do. I do very well. And I, I remember actually um, hearing a little bit about the honest issues some of the actors came back with. I know one of them had a heart attack. And... Uh, Sheen came back completely changed. Uh, everyone seemed to have a real... Just the same with, like, Deer Hunter. Uh, when they all went on set, they really went to a dark, dark, dark place. And when they came out of it, they came out changed, um, but not necessarily for the better. So to me, when he went to work with him later on, he already knew the mind games that he was set up for. And it was interesting that he went to Sheen to actually get some guidance on it um, because he knew basically that Sheen came out of it broken. 
Yeah, but he does a great Richie Cunningham impression, I thought. I, uh, <laughs> which I think, all you have to do, right, is you get, you get your Kermit the Frog and you just make it slightly more nervous. And, but, but his Bill Clinton... His blue, Bill, Bill Clinton was Bill really Clinton. good. Bill yes. Clinton. I've got two Bill Clintons for you. Hold on. Yeah, give us By a the way, don't, not that I want to be Bill. seen as the lightweight <laughs> leg of this trio, <laughs> but I've got some impressions to play you. <laughs> do uh, you, Frank Spencer? <laughs> <laughs> I've done a mon- I've done a montage. Ah, oh, beautiful. I've done a mon I've done a montage. Hold on. <laughs> Having difficulty finding my montage. Clinton montage. Here we go. Are we keeping all this bit in. <laughs> it makes me sad that one day my kids will stop wanting to cuddle. You know that those great hugs will be gone. I tell the president during one visit. If you raise them right, it'll never stop. He says, proudly showing me a photo on his desk. It's a recent photo of him and Chelsea snuggling on a couch. Again, the West Wing got it right. Presidents are fathers, just like the rest of us. Saying goodbye on that particular visit, the staff wants a picture. We all pose, crowded into Betty Curry's office, just off the Oval. It's me, Chief of Staff John Podesta, and the gang of young kids that really make the place run. Wait a minute, wait wait a minute, what's going on in l- 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 Let me get in that picture comes that familiar southern draw as the most important man in the world tries to fight his way into our photo so the thing is not only are you getting ron howard and bill clinton stories above the people who read read to you performed i think is a word by, mm. by rob Lowe, um you're also getting an extra element that you just can't have on the written page which is as you say, how, you know, he's the one who, who pointed this out to me, how good he is at catch, capturing the essence of people and being an actor, which mm. kind of adds credibility to the book, I think. Yes, absolutely. Completely. And I think some of my favorite stories um, were just about when he would go on the auditions and like for Footloose, how he pops his knee out and next thing you know, Kevin Bacon's in. And... He didn't get the job, but he really goes into detail about what the experience was for him, um, his failures. Like he really delves into that part of just the hard part of it, being an actor. And then when he gets on screen and he is, you know, goofing off and he talks about the pelting rain and how they re- had to recreate the rain and the outsiders and um, it was freezing and painful. He also gives you that how cool Patrick Swayze is. Oh, I, I mean, we all know Patrick Swayze is cool, but we just didn't know how cool he really is. I, I have to say, it, it, it's almost, uh, he, Patrick Swayze is my favorite character in the book. <laughs> um, and it's almost like he's sort of irritatingly cool and good at stuff. Good at everything, yeah. apparently. Yeah. Everything. From bare, bare, bareback horse riding to uh, making an egg. He's the... the, the I've got some clips of Swayze oh, too. Oh, Unfortunately, <laughs> it's almost like you read the script. <laughs> In keeping with the theme of toughening us up and having us interact with the genuine articles, the next morning finds us gathered to play some local tough guys in a game of tackle football on cement. I huddle up the greasers. I am in my element. Back in Ohio, I spent countless days like these, drawing out button hooks and go routes with my gang of North Dayton toughs. Our opposition is really no different, although I am a tad unsettled by my suspicion that some of them wouldn't mind sending a Hollywood actor to the hospital. I look at Team Greaser. Clearly, I'm going to have an issue with Dylan. He has the boombox playing Bowie and is wearing his ever-present motorcycle boots. He yawns and scratches his chest. I know a blocker when I see one. Matt, play line, I say. Cool, man, he replies, lighting a Marlboro. Machio is so tiny, I have to hide him somewhere as well. Cruz and Emilio are fast as hell, and gung-ho, so they'll be receivers. Swayze, of course, wants to play all positions, and probably could. Hey, Soda, he says, calling me by my character's name. See that big dude with a goatee? I'm going to knock his block off on the first play. He's got a look in his eye that I will come to know well, and I figure I better let him do what he wants. Go for it, man. Do you think that his uh, his clips and his impressions um, uh, actually, and and we'll we'll conclude in terms of his style. I think we've we've kind of all agreed that his delivery of the book is 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 really exemplary. He's a really good storyteller. Um, But going to the title of the book, do you feel that he's actually uh, telling all these Hollywood stories and and stories about the people he comes across as he as though he's your friend? 
Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I feel like it'd be doing it over, you know, over a beer, shared beer or something. Yeah. It, make, it makes me want to have a beer with him. It I makes know. me want to have a chat with him. I may call him a liar and a hypocrite, but that's just me trying to be an alpha male and I'm not really in he is and he's cool and he gets chicks and yeah no uh, he gets too many chicks doesn't he yeah apparently he does so to to where the book kind of ends um as you continue on with the scandalous nature of Hollywood um he and his wife had a situation called nanny gate and the book doesn't touch on it because I think the way it's ended, it ends sort of with that political start with JFK Jr. And then with that sort of West Wing political end summation. So it really doesn't delve into a situation again that, um, you know, is what's difficult about being a celebrity. And they had two nannies that they ended up having to, to sue and then they were countersued. Uh, because of lewd and, you know, inappropriate behavior in the household. One was against Rob, one was against his wife. And after a few years of going back and forth, they both were sort of dropped and disappeared. And you never heard anything about a settlement out of court, no peep anywhere about any of it. So no one really knows what happened. But it's just, you know, one of those things that when you're really telling sort of the good, the bad, and the ugly, it really does, and maybe he can't legally talk about it because of the hush-hush nature of the way it ended. But you really think about just that sort of devious nature and, and what is fabricated and what really is truth. Look, it's, it's airbrushed, but yeah. isn't, isn't the whole of Hollywood airbrushed? If, if, if it yeah. is... If I, I don't think I have called it right that it's a, a you know, a, a play for the rewriting of his history for a pop at the, the, the presidency. I mean, I, I don't know. I keep, I keep looking at that idea and going, no, 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 no. And they go, it could be true. It could be no, 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 no. And I don't think it'll work. But actually, as much as I'm calling him a hypocrite and a liar, actually, I think we can both agree that the book is so brilliantly delivered oh absolutely it's brilliantly written brilliantly delivered i wish i could be in the states right now to see him on tour and mm. just have him actually you know take the questions yeah, from I, the audience and to hear the immediate responses to possibly some of the things that we're talking about now yeah i don't know how much he's going to be putting himself out there yeah um, I don't know how if he's going to be taking questions. I mean, I could see you and me going have a bottle of tequila and doing some heckling, maybe. <laughs> um, In the background. Yeah. No, I just because I really don't know how. His... Steve's not. Steve wouldn't be up for that. Nah. No. He could. He could oh, drive. I don't know. I don't know. I'm... You could drive the getaway car. <laughs> <laughs> Start the car. Start the van. Start yeah, the car. Start the car. Start the car. I'm... Cheryl's standing up, Steve. Start the car. <laughs> On the night before principal photography, Francis has one last task for us. He wants the three Curtis brothers to spend the night at the house we will be shooting in and to do a marathon improv session. He will observe with Outsider's author, Essie Hinton. Swayze, Howell, and I are petrified. It's one thing to improv a scene or two, but to do hours of it in front of the director and the author? Back in the van, we huddle together, working out a framework. We decide that we should cook dinner, figuring that that will eat up a lot of clock and give us something to talk about as well. Problematically, neither Tommy nor I can boil an egg, but, as usual, Swayze has experience in the field. I'll cook us a steak. You two make the salad, he says. Zone 1 Radio. You're listening to Audio Book Club, the world's only interactive audiobook review podcast. Uh, you can find us on Zone One Radio, on DAB Digital Radio in London, or anywhere else as a podcast, including on Apple and Google Podcasts and Spotify. Just search for hashtag Audio Book Club. And we'd love to hear from you. Tell us what you think on Twitter and Instagram using the hashtag Audio Book Club, or you can find us on Facebook by searching the same. Uh, Emily from Dis says, uh, really enjoyed this, very thoughtful, well written and read, and gets the 
balance about right between respecting some competencies and telling you some of the more salacious details. As another review has noted, the later years were covered in far less detail than the earlier ones. More on the West Wing years in particular would have been nice, but I don't want to nitpick. Some audiobooks can feel a bit of a chore to return to, but I always look forward to getting back to this one. I hope he writes more. Melanie from Saltburn by the Sea says, wasn't quite sure what to expect from this book. Biography from birth to present or any anecdotes? Rob Lowe just tells stories from his exciting life, most of it about famous friends, but also about his family. I really enjoyed this book and it was nice to hear the stories in Rob Lowe's own voice. Sometimes it feels as if he's bragging or name dropping, but I got past that and really got into the telling of this book. Uh, Robin with a Y, of seemingly no fixed abode, uh, says, interesting insight into a world so different to my own. Lowe's narration adds to a sense of personal sharing. Not a whole lot of soul bared, but uh, enough to give some understanding of the man, his achievements, and have to admit, uh, have uh, made me really like him. Uh, the jewellery was out previously, too good looking to be likeable. Um, I found his recount of his involvement in the West Wing interesting. An easy listen helps a few commuting hours fly by. And someone called Curly Wordy, great name, uh, says, uh, I've always had a soft spot for Rob Lowe, and although that hasn't changed, after listening to this audiobook, I'm afraid I feel uh, like this was a waste of a credit. The story was slow and Rob's voice unemotional and unfeeling. It was easy to switch off from listening, uh, which is a shame as I wasn't Boo. expecting that. Boo! Wow. That's just wrong. It's a great book. Harsh. It is a good book. You know, it it, it was good, wasn't it? Uh, uh, Just from a personal point of view, I was hoping for a little more Parks and Recreation. Huge fan of Parks and Rec and uh, uh, finished the whole box set uh, probably a year or so ago. But it would have been nice to have a little bit of Anne Perkins. One of my absolute favourites. Zone 1 Radio. Right then, so we'll down tools on stories I only tell my friends. Thank you very much, Mr. Rob Lowe. I now turn to you, my esteemed colleagues. What would you like to review for next time? Well, I've got a couple of ideas. Um, Again, just to reiterate, on the understanding that we're choosing what uh, to what comes next at the moment, but the idea is eventually we'll attract some listeners and they will make the decision as to what we all communally read next. Um, I'm very aware that I've chosen one and Cheryl has chosen Mm -hmm. one. Uh, So I was thinking, you mentioned that the Steve Jobs autobiography kind of turned you on to audiobooks in general. So that might be a a good one to do. Um, Then there's the Bill Clinton uh, and James Patterson wrote a book together while we're on American stuff. We might. So Bill Clinton and the thriller writer James Patton have written a book called The President is Missing that is available on Audible. Um, but controversially, I've got a third suggestion, which I know is going to appeal to Steve, oh. uh, but I'm not sure it's going to appeal to Cheryl. So uh, if I start with the words Pearl Mackie. Yeah, go on. I'm interested. I'm interested. In a post-apocalyptic world... Right, I see. Forest 404, is this? It is indeed Forest 404. Well done. Um, which I thought was... Oh, a, you know, I've been paying attention. Which, in, in theory, is a series of podcasts by the BBC. Um, but actually, it's... it's. I think, we again, we've discovered why the, the audio book club domain names are all taken, but no one's actually done this, because it's actually a blooming lot of work. Um, because you have to listen to the 10-hour book twice. So I thought I'd make it, make it a bit easier on us by going for Forest 404, which I think is a very innovative use of um, audio and, and the medium. Um, it's 10 episodes, okay. but every episode has the episode as part of it, and then a little lecture about something relevant, be it... Uh, uh, irrelevant to the episode. So the, in a scientific post-apocalyptic world, there are things like, you know, it, uh, there's a professor of being a cyborg and a professor of global warming. And after the, each episode, they give a little lecture. And then there's a soundscape. So I think it's it's done a really good job of broadening the medium. And I, 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 it, if, even if we don't review it, I would heartily recommend that people give it a listen it's available uh, from the bbc uh, but yeah those are my th- those are my three suggestions uh, cheryl oh so 
yeah, I, I don't really know how to follow that. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm like, um, okay. I still think that bad blood is good because the trial is still going for Theranos. Yeah, so just again for, for, for us Brits, because I didn't know what that was all I about know, until, I know. until you made me right. So I'm going to. It's huge. It's just, it's a I really to- good, it's a really strong story. And, it, and she follows Steve Jobs, um, reads his book. His her employees can tell where she is in the book based on how can she's I, behaving. Can I just take you step back, step. Yeah. So, uh, Theranos was a, an American startup, yep. uh, and their product was supposedly blood testing machines that made blood testing just go and prick your finger, mm-hmm. and you can be you can they can tell you whether you've got right. chlamydia <laughs> or herpes or or you know the common cold or or a, or a red blood cell deficiency, and it's. You know, just one tiny prick. Um, but it turns out that the woman who was running it was all built on lies. It was all built on sand. Right. Uh, it was a fake it till you make it, but they never they made never it. made it. And then they got into trouble, and the company has been yeah. closed down. She was quite a charismatic figure. Yeah. Again, bad blood. Uh, yeah. Would recommend it. The trial's been postponed. Yes, I, I did see where they were. Putting that off for a little while. Yeah, so maybe we want to save that. Uh, I, I agree, it's a great book, having, yeah, having listened to it. I'm trying to look at, you know, going beyond just the biography, the autobiography, because those are easy fallbacks. I think fiction needs to be in there somewhere. Yes, it does. It and, truly and it, does. So, so the, my, my attempt with the Bill Clinton, James Patterson, was yep. to bring in something that was both American and fiction. Correct. Uh, so yeah, Steve, what did you think? What what, what are you going for? Uh, so a suggestion. That's, that's all right. No, that's fine. I've been letting you letting you fly. It's been great to have the creativity going on there. Um, so I was looking at the Lost Children Archive, <laughs> the Lost Children Archive by uh, Valeria uh, Luiselli. I hope I pronounced that right. Um, but this looked uh, this looked quite. Um, quite interesting to me it's it's actually quite a new book it's also uh, a female writer as well um and uh yeah um um but it looked quite interesting anyway and it's read by a woman and it's uh it's all women and it's america and it's fiction as well um so that's what i was kind of that's what i, I kind of thought we could do because i'm just sort of thinking we're doing quite a lot of um factual stuff um so that was my thought to uh, to mix it up. I've never heard of this uh, author or her books, but it looked quite interesting. Steve, I don't think we're going to have a vote this time. I think we're going to nominate you as our mm-hmm. glorious leader to decide which of these uh, productions you'd like us to listen to next. Yes. Okay. Um, I I would like to I pretty park Pearl Mackey if that's okay. I think we should do it though. Uh, just stick into an audio book. I I will. I'd probably go for Lost Children Archive for a bit of fiction for a change. So I just steamrolled both your suggestions there, and I don't want to give that impression. That's that's fine. That's that's, that's what brilliant. we're here for. That's yeah. why you're the boss. That, that sounds brilliant. That's why you are cat cat herder general. That I'm, that is your job. I'm downloading it now. Oh, fantastic! Here we go then. So Lost Children Archive is by uh, Valeria Luiselli. And uh, long listed for the Women's Prize for Fiction in 2019, by the way. It's a uh, um, a family who in New York packs the car and sets out on a road trip. A mother, a father, a boy and a girl. They head southwest uh, to the regions of the US, which used to be Mexico. They drive for hours through deserts and mountains. They stop at diners when they're hungry and sleep in motels when it gets dark. The little girl tells surreal knock-knock jokes and makes them all laugh. The little boy educates them and corrects them in when they're wrong. The mother and the father barely speak to each other. Meanwhile, thousands of children are journeying north, traveling to the US border from Central America. A grandmother or aunt has packed a backpack for them, putting in a Bible, a toy, some clean underwear. They have been met by a coyote, a man who speaks to them roughly and frightens them. They cross a river on rubber tubing and walk for days, saving whatever food and water they can. They climb to the top of a train and travel precariously in the open container on the top. None of them will make it to the border. Um... So there we go. Hold on, Cheryl. Don't download it yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There you go. <laughs> okay. So that's next month then. Uh, Lost Children, Lost Children Archive is our, 
uh, is our uh, is our gambit. So uh, stay tuned uh, for that. I think that just about wraps it up for this edition of Audio Book Club, the world's only interactive audio book uh, review podcast with me, Steve Phillips. So all it remains for us to do is say a big thank you to Matthew Layton. Thank you, Steve. And to Cheryl Monkhouse. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Matthew. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you <laughs> thank you God uh, but most of all thanks to you for listening a gentle reminder you can find us on uh, Zone 1 Radio on DAB Digital Radio in London check out zone1radio.co.uk for the precise times or anywhere else in the world of podcast uh, including Apple and Google and Spotify uh, just search for Audio Book Club you can uh, talk to us at any time we will respond promise um, you can tell us what you think on Twitter and Instagram using the hashtag Audio Book Club or searching the same in Facebook we'll be back very soon to talk about the lost children archive by valeria luiselli see you then young man you are quite good you remind me very much of a young warren Beatty. driving away down his long winding driveway i suddenly see him running down the hill chasing me in his big white bathrobe young man young man he calls rushing up to my driver's side window I thought you might like to have these, he says, slightly out of breath. His arms are filled with products from Fabergé, where he sits on the board. He fills my car with boxes and boxes of brewed aftershave and soap on a rope. Thank you, Mr. Grant, I say. Enjoy them, he says behind those famous big black glasses. And good luck in the movies. You're going to do great.